President Tinubu's budget presentation to national lawmakers and most especially the finer points of that presentation included an overview of capitals and overheads. Lai Omotola, a Harvard-trained economist and chief executive officer of Confederated Facilitators Limited, is here in the studio with us. Many thanks for joining us. Now, what's Thank you. Your, Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's a pleasure to have you here. Yeah. So what's your assessment of President Bola Tinubu's budget of Renewed Hope? Well, um, thank you once again. I think the budget is budget of courage. And true to the type of the nature of the president, the truth of the matter is that um, ordinarily, with the way the economy is presently, one will be thinking that, why don't you cut your coat according to your size? But again, for a, for a president that has an expansionary view, that wants legacy projects, he would not agree to cut your coat according to your size. He will want to take a risk. He will want to be courageous. He will want to do something big. So that is the reason why you have this big budget, the biggest ever, which is 27 trillion. So my take is that the philosophy, the economic philosophy of the president is that we need to spend our way out of these economic doldrums. Okay, so for the average Nigerian that isn't very uh, well-versed in the economics and the budgetary presentations that our presidency uh, tends to go through, um, famed economist Bismarck Romane said that the bottom line is Nigerians want to know how is this going to affect the price of rice, bread, tomatoes, especially coming up in, in the Christmas time and going forward. Can you explain to them how this can be positive for them, um, spending one's way out of this economic mess? Okay, I think that one of the mistakes that we make is that we always think that the president is the only person in governance that will solve all problems. Don't forget that there are three tiers of governments. The local government, the state government, and the, the federal. Now, the state government and the local government also have a budget. It is expected that the budget of the local government is the one to meet the needs of the people in the grassroots. But a lot of people do not give concern to the budgetary activities of local government that is the closest government to the common man. Likewise, the state government. Everybody just pays so much attention to the budget of federal government that when you look at it in terms of GDP, it's not up to 10% of the GDP. Now, there is a need for us to also give the same scrutiny that we're giving that of federal government to the state government and the local government because their own budget will immediately impact the common man. The one of the federal government is just like to make business environment more friendly to the people. Now, when we are not looking at the budget in specific, this is the budget that just want to lay a foundation. It is not going to address the microeconomic problems as presented now when we talk about the price of rice gari coming down. For that to come down, we need a lot of agricultural produce and agricultural impacts and budgetary impact into agri and the rest. And you would agree with me that when we begin to plant, it's not going to happen between now and December. So we don't likely see how much that will come down. But again, the palliatives that the government has given to the local government and the state government, if adequately utilized, the common man should be able to smile this Christmas. Well, now during this budget presentation, the president said the economy is expected to grow by at least 3.76% next year, while inflation would moderate to 21.4%. How realistic are these projections? Well, um, the projection, like you see, is a forecast. The forecast, you need to be optimistic with your forecast. But if you look at the budget, 
there are variables there and the variables are assumptions if all things remain the same we will achieve this what are the all things that must remain the same the government has said 1.7 million barrels we must produce 1.7 million barrels a day um our exchange rates must be like 780 or 750 stable then um what's it called um our inflation we want to put inflation on 21 percent and then the exchange rates and then uh, how much do we sell per barrel must be close to 79. now these are assumptions but they are all variables if a war should break out any side of the world today it's going to affect these variables just recently you see what is coming out in the opec meeting it has started affecting the variables now these are the variables that the government is thinking that they should be stable for 2024 and when you're preparing a cash flow if there's any any danger to your variables then all the things you make at forecast begin to be affected so the variables not 100 percent in the hands of government were there any other very interesting takeaways from his budget presentation did anything surprise you yes what really surprised me in this um, budget that should be inclusive was that when you look at and now this is the perspective a lot of people have not looked at when you look at that budget you will see that recurrent expenditure is going for 9.5 to 9.7 trillion naira now the required expenditure is administrative salaries and the rest of the things and then you will now say what is the revenue revenue is 18 trillion and then you have deficit of 9 trillion that is we can't make the balance and we want to go and borrow money what will surprise me is that we're paying the workforce and everybody 9 trillion and they're only producing 18 not even they're producing 9 trillion because the 9 trillion is to themselves i mean in the business sector you 50 percent of your expenditure does not go to recurrent if i'm paying someone 1 million naira i expect that at the end of the month the person should be giving me between 10 or 8 million so we are spending so much money on the civil service and everybody working in government and we are getting very little in return now if you look at today as today is 60 percent of the work in the civil service can be automated 60 percent and that brings the cost down to like four trillion but we're still running a myopic archaic moribund civil service that is not at the cutting edge so it is 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 costing us a lot so i expect that the budget should reduce cost at this at this stage and then secondly the people actually bringing out the revenue are the business people that they tax now i will expect that this budget should have like two trillion as in, in intensive intensive for incentives for business people that is two trillion naira intervention in their various businesses but what this budget have done if you look at it critically is that the budget have said look anything that has to do with infrastructure which is the business the private sector people should go and handle it so we are talking about our water we're talking about our roads we're talking about transportation we're talking about aviation and if you look at all these sectors these are sectors that are lacking in funding that they need intervention as i speak to you today airlines the best of the airlines average three aircrafts which should not be so and the reason why our exchange rate is also going up is because people are paying so much on tickets to travel so what that means is that we can, if we can domesticate our airlines to be national carrier we won't have to pay pounds and dollars to buy tickets so that's one of the things areas that i think the government should have uh, incorporated in this budget <clears throat> 
Now, the opposition party, the PDP, believes that the budget has no mechanism for economic recovery as the projected official rate of 750 to 1 US dollar is suffocating. I'd like to know your thoughts on that. Oh, well, um, everybody would know that um, that's a political statement because when PDP was in, at the ends of affairs, the first thing we even realized is that budgets would not be approved until the middle of the year. This time around, budget is coming at the right time, the right physical year. So by end of December, when we enter January, but budget implementation will start. You don't have that doing PDP. Now, secondly, is that this is the first time in 24 years that you're not going to see a fair subsidy in this budget. Fair subsidy is totally gone, zero. It has never happened before. Now, when you're taking fair subsidy away, that shows that you must not concentrate on other things. And what are the other things that um, this government wants to concentrate on? More than ever before, security, the issue of security, insecurity. All of us know that businesses won't come here if the level of insecurity is still very high. So the government is putting so much money. Now, I cannot see if those money will be implemented or if they will get to where they want to be. But for the review of what we have theoretically, the government is spending about $500 billion for defense, police, and intelligence, which they want to address the issue of security, which they inherited. Now, the second thing is the issue of health. The health, spending like $1.3 trillion on health. If that money is adequately implemented, I think <coughs> our health infrastructure will be better for it. So the problem with the criticism of PDP is that they've not come out with figures and facts and exactly which area of this budget that they have concerns about. But for the exchange rate, the exchange rate is a matter of demand and supply. It's a free market. The Naira is, is, is floating. And is not in anybody's hands. It's all in our hands. And I actually wanted to touch on that point of the lack of details in the budget because we know a couple of lawmakers complained about such. Um, the, the example is that if you're going to sign a contract, you would need to know the details within it. And they're being asked to deliberate on uh, situations that they don't have specific details for that. I'm wondering if that's quite uncommon to happen and whether 30 days... Um, of this uh, review and implementation is going to be enough. Yeah, everybody that has uh, followed budget um, process will understand that details come from the MDAs, the the heads of MDAs. Now, before the budget is passed, all the different parts of the budget is taken to ad hoc committees. So this is where the MDAs come and I give a total line by line, item by item details of what the budget is. That's where you see the entire details. And it's usually open to the public to come and critique and see that. And then for the 30 days, 30 days is tough. But again, we're in a situation whereby we have to meet up with that time. And I pray that the, the lawmakers are able to burn the night candle to ensure that that budget is passed on time. Because that would be a plus to them. Now, you talked about, you know, national defense, internal security being top priority for the 2024 budget. And you also said you're not sure, you know, if the money would actually go to the areas where it's supposed to go. Because I know that from experience, we've seen over the years that there's been increased military spending, but it hasn't necessarily, you know, made, it, made the country safer. So I'm wondering how the government can plug all loopholes that could affect implementation in this regard. Well, I'm not government spokesperson. But in the past, budget performance have highly reached 60%. And what is budget performance? Budget performance is actual implementation of the money. Okay? It's always a problem. So if you look at last year's budget, you, you will see a difference of like um, 13, 14 trillion was what was actually used. And you pass 14 trillion. So the actual, so, and the reason for this is the bureaucracy. There's so much bureaucratic, bureaucratic processes in civil service. And that is what is um, affecting the budget performance. So you can only speak at the end of this fiscal year 
to see the budget performance. And if the budget performance is poor, that means the budget has failed. It's just as simple as that. But one of the challenges and the main challenge is our civil service uh, bureaucratic. And sometimes it may not be their fault. It's as a result of lack of also infrastructure technology. You know, the way the, civil, the private sector work is different from the way the civil se sector work but in the private sector. About corruption. Isn't that also an issue? <laughs> corruption. <laughs> I, I don't want... You see, the issue of corruption is, is so huge. Let's not deceive ourselves. You can't use four years to fight corruption. The, 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 the person that we all believe that should beat corruption to stand still was Buhari. We all saw what happened. I always think that um, we should not fight corruption. We should negotiate corruption. Do you understand? We, if, when you say you want to fight for corruption, it does not end. But we should negotiate corruption. What it means is that when you steal, uh, we show you what you have stolen, and we give amnesty that return like 60% of what you have stolen, and uh, you can go with the remaining 40. Then for us to be in court to the end of the administration, and then you don't get anything. We should negotiate corruption and not um, fight corruption. I'm very sorry to say that, but that's the reality. Remember, America will tell you that we don't negotiate with terrorists. I was just about to say that. Yeah, yeah. America tells you that you tell don't you negotiate that. with terrorists. But what is happening with um, Israel and Hamas today? Oh, no, what's happening today? A slippery slope. Sorry? It's become a slippery slope. Exactly. So, I mean, let's be realistic with ourselves. We've been fighting corruption for 62 years, and it has not declined. It's always been increasing. So, I mean, talking about fighting corruption is a cake as far as I'm concerned. We should negotiate it. If a man has stolen 10 billion, it's difficult for any court to convict a billionaire in anywhere in the world. So, it's good that we should just negotiate it. If we can take 60% of that money, give him amnesty, and then he will just write the rest off and use that 60% to help the people that need the money. Wow, that's... That doesn't make sense. N well, it does not make moral sense, but moral. In, in, in your justification, it just seems that the slippery slope has started, and I don't mean that in a good way. Um, once you allow one thing to go by. You're going to have to allow many things to go by, and you will have to renegotiate the renegotiation of corruption. But um, the, the, the reason why I say this, uh, we shouldn't be talking about fighting corruption. We should be talking about preventing corruption. Do you understand? Preventing it. We should be proactive. It shouldn't happen. And once it has happened, it's difficult to repatriate the money back. So we should be talking about more of preventive measures and what are the preventive measures? If everything is transparent, and if everybody can account, and if there will be consequences, immediately it happens. And then we can be talking about preventing corruption. Not something that has uh, become taking a life of its own. And uh, I mean, no, we should rethink it. Okay, so in order to achieve the projection of a real GDP growth rate of 3.76%, what significant changes should we be making regarding infrastructure deficit, insecurity, and labor market constraints, you know, within the next fiscal year? You, you see, the thing, the world that we live today, you should know that is the world of knowledge. What you don't know is better than you. And the reason why you fail is because you don't know. Nigeria, as it is today, the FRS can make 27 trillion, more than 27 trillion, in this 2024. And I boast to say they can make 50 trillion. What that implies is that the country needs not to go to borrow money from anybody to clear its deficits if it can set an agenda for the FRS. Uh, to bring this 50 trillion here. Because the money, you see them there. I'll give you an example. When WK came in, look at what he did. And immediately, he said, look, I brought in like 174 billion into the system. Why? What he was just doing was to wake the dead horse. All of that. People, things that people have ignored. And you have a lot of them in the entire federation. If people want to put work to action, the FRS will raise 50 trillion and pay up Nigeria's debts. 
Then the second thing is that an economy can't grow beyond the businesses that they do. Now, today's stock market, you will see the big businesses, the likes of Dangote, MTN, Airtel, Access Bank, turning in revenue of 1.5 trillion, 1.6 trillion. Now, imagine if MTN was not in the system. Imagine if telecoms was not in the system. So the country needs what is called new money, not recycled money. And how do you bring in new money? You begin to develop your industries. You begin to pump money in, into industry. Governments will not create jobs. Businesses will be established to create these jobs. Do you, do you understand? So there are certain fundamentals we need to get right. That government is just going to create the enabling environment. If you look at the era of MTN, government just gave a license. Okay and ensure that the environment was fine. Mr. Lyomotola, so yes. sorry to cut in, but we have to go now.